after Tom Hafey, there was Tony Jewell, yep. who took them to the promised land in 1980, their most recent premiership. Coaches are judged on the premierships, but I think you've got to be judged on what you get out the players that are there. We've seen sides that Mickey Mouse could have coached to win the premiership. I've seen other sides that Jesus Christ might have had a bit of trouble getting them up. The Richmond Football Club rewrote the record books on Saturday, September 27th, 1980, with a grand final victory over arch-rival Collingwood securing their 10th VFL flag. So how does a team which finished the 1980 season with a then-record margin-winning premiership go to rattling money tins to try and keep the club alive just 10 years later? The drop-off was extraordinary. The focus of this video, however, is not to dwell on how the team fell throughout the 80s. That aspect of Richmond's existence has already been heavily documented over the years. If you have not seen it, I highly recommend the documentary The Lost Years. This film focuses on the fall of the Tigers and how decisions around player trading, coaching contracts and other things led to the club bottoming out and being at the very bottom of the ladder at the dawn of the AFL era in 1990. This video instead will centre around Richmond from 1990 to 2010 and its multiple attempts at re-establishing itself as a powerhouse club. About three months after I was appointed coach, uh, Richmond announces that they were, I don't know, $1.2 million in debt and the bank's going to close down the club. So it never had the facilities, never had the facilities, never had the money to go with what turned out to be the modern game and that was drafting, you know pump up your football department, put plenty of money into your football department, get better recruiters out there in the field, get a number of people out there all over Australia, giving you good information on players, watching all the schools, watching all the underage kids. You're not relying on some old champion that lives in Mildura, you know, ringing him up and saying, you know, any good players up there. As Michael Roberts reports, the Tigers have to raise $1 million by the end of October to save them from extinction. They came in their thousands from every era, from 1920 to the current crop. But the biggest ovation was saved for legendary Richmond tough man, Jack Dyer. <laughs> Present Tiger coach, Kevin Bartlett, was enthusiastic about the future. We've always had a very latent uh, uh, group of people who have supported us strongly uh, in large crowds when we've been successful. To those people who uh, have been missing over the last few years, well, here's an opportunity to save the club. At the start of the 1990s, Richmond were a rabble. They were in crippling debt and coming off a terrible end to the 80s where it seemed like they farewelled a coach, captain or board member on an annual basis. Today, President Neville Crowe, flanked by coach Kevin Bartlett, announced the battle had been won. In fact, $1,033,626 in cash is sitting in a bank account and even more is expected to flow in over the next few weeks. The Tigers raised the money in some weird and wonderful ways. Seven-year-old Christopher O'Brien started the ball rolling when he donated his birthday money. What do you think of the Tigers? Do you think they should survive? Yeah. Why is that? Because they're the best team. Following the successful Save Our Skins campaign, Richmond ended the very first national AFL season third last in 11th place. As he brings it into full forward. Hogg takes front position. Oh, nearly took the mark. Nash on the left foot, don't tell me he's kicked it. Yes, he has. What a day for the Tigers. Chris Nash has kicked his third. Look at the Richmond supporters. Look at the scoreboard. Richmond 24-15, Lee Collingwood 15-12. Apart from the famous Mother's Day massacre over the reigning Premier's Collingwood, who had won the flag in 1990, 
The 1991 season was just as disappointing as the previous one for the Tigers. Once again, they ended the season third last on the ladder. It also signalled the end for current coach and Tiger legend Kevin Bartlett, with his replacement being former Hawthorne legend and Premiership coach Alan Jeans. Maynard, McDermott, coming up for possession number 41, 42 as the siren sounds to put the Richmond fans out of their misery. The Adelaide fans back there in South Australia are certainly happy with that result. Adelaide winning by 110 points, 24-19-163. Richmond 7-11-53. When Adelaide defeated Richmond by 110 points at the MCG in round 20, 1992, a couple of things happened. Firstly, it signalled the end of Alan Jeans. Four-time Premiership coach Alan Jeans would be there for just one season and with no success. Who managed to be at the helm for one solitary season. Secondly, it was also the day a future Tiger champion was sitting in the crowd. And even though they had just been absolutely belted, he couldn't wait to sign a contract with the Tigers. I never really thought of playing for anyone else because I could go to Richmond under the father and son rule. I had that luxury. Dad and me flew over here on the Sunday, watched Richmond play Adelaide. Richmond got pumped by about 15 goals. We walked over to Punt Road after the game, sat in Cameron Schwab's office. He offered me a four-year contract. It was pretty ordinary uh, coin. And I looked at it and Dad said to Schwabby, look, we'll fly home tonight and we'll have a look at it and we'll let you know. And I said, no way, Dad. We're signing this now. Always wearing his heart on his sleeve, Matthew Richardson of Devonport, Tasmania was the favourite player of any Richmond fan born in the 90s. The sight of the big number 12 in full flight kept Tiger fans coming to the football during such a dark period of the club's history. Richo was never afraid to show emotion. He was a character and one of the best pack marks any fan had ever seen. And still to this day, he has scored the most goals out of any AFL VFL player on the MCG. Yes, good evening and welcome to Waverley Park. A special night tonight. Two teams with so much to play for. Fitzroy 10th last year, Richmond 13th. Both teams out there. It's the first of the semi-finals in the 1993 Fosters Cup. And Richmond, on the other hand, have bolted away from Sydney at Lavington by 80 points and beat Hawthorne convincingly last week on this ground by 40 points. And for Richmond, Lambert, Knights and Maxfield were outstanding last week. McQueen misses out and the two men that have kicked their goals, Hogg and Jackson playing and Turner's been in brilliant form. So both squads pretty close to full strength. The crowd has built up in the last 10 minutes. It's a healthy one and we're back with the opening bounce after this. Back because Jeff Hogg has kicked four and looks like kicking a dozen the way he's going. Number 11 is Wayne Herneman to the half forward line, all uncontested here, Scott Turner. Now he can bring it to the pocket, another man on his own and the mark taken by Chris Nash. He's deep in the pocket, now he's going to chip it across here, that's intelligent football as Turner has marked on a better angle, 45 degree angle this time but only 30 metres from goal and the Tigers coming back hard. And there's a former great, well two former great Tigers, the coach John Northey and Francis Burt, one of the greatest players to ever play the game. John Swooper Northey was appointed Richmond coach for the upcoming 1993 season, and he immediately made an impact with the players and fans during the pre-season Foster's Cup. Starved of success and coming off five seasons in a row finishing in the bottom four, Northey was able to give Tiger fans early season hope by leading them to the 1993 Foster's Cup Grand Final. What a 55 seconds. It's now at Fitzroy's end of the ground. Even a point would probably win it. Lynch taps it down. Hool in up with it. Fleming grabs it. Tries to shuffle it out. The Richmond rebound through Barry Young. 43 seconds left. Oh, bounce. Favours Nash. Nash in the full forward. And Metagola has marked. He was behind, boy. Goal. He was behind Peter. He wasn't shoulder to shoulder. He wasn't with his man. Menegola will kick from 30 metres, a pressure kick. Even if he kicks the goal, it's still not over. 
Todd Minagala kicks and goals. Six points. The Tigers lead in this magnificent game. It doesn't deserve to be a loser. We have 10 seconds of play left in this match. Well, can Fitzroy produce a moment of magic? They need it. Can someone conjure a trick to get them a goal in 10 seconds to take it to extra time? Lynch tries. An attack on the footy by Fleming was big. Fitzroy have wasted seven seconds. Richmond are there. They've made it, the Tigers. The boys have done the supporters and the club proud, I mean, just their sheer persistence one out over the night. We were probably struggling up till half time, but they just kept persisting, kept grinding away. We didn't play well, perhaps the opposition didn't let us play well, but they kept, you know, kept hanging in there and hanging in and it was just sheer persistence, but, you know, it was just a great team effort. And uh, from your point of view as, as uh, having coached Melbourne and lifted them, what do you think was needed particularly at Richmond to get a commitment like they showed you last Wednesday night and tonight? Well, that's difficult to say. I think, uh, Robbo, actually, I think the players just wanted to do it. I mean, when you've been on the bottom for as long as Richmond have and uh, the players were just sick and tired of that, I think they've, they've put in a, an extremely hard pre-season. They've got themselves extremely fit, you know, as fit as anybody at this time of the year. And that just gives you a chance to win. Of course, along comes that... Uh, we, we've had those four or five recruits that have been very important for us, which has taken a lot of pressure off Knights, Lambert, Campbell, uh, Hogg, Jackson, those types of players, and they can play with a bit more freedom. But, uh, you know, they're, they're just magnificent young boys. Well, with The Bombers down to Gallon Richmond by 23 points, 102 to 79. Football fever struck Melbourne in a big way last night when more than 75,000 people flocked to Waverley Park, smashing the record for a night series match. More than 5,000 were turned away at the gates, but those who did get in were treated to a spectacular pre-game show. Unfortunately, Richmond were beaten by Essendon in the grand final. The Bombers actually went on to have a fairy tale season, eventually winning the Premiership against the odds as the Baby Bombers beat Carlton. Richmond, however had yet another dismal season, winning only four games and finishing second last. And even though they unearthed a baby-faced Matthew Richardson in round seven, radical changes were on the horizon heading into the 1994 season. The shock of the last-minute swap deals today saw Richmond captain and star forward Jeff Hogg become a Fitzroy player. But the Lions paid a premium, going to punt road, Paul Broderick, Michael Gale and Matthew Dundas. The biggest thing that came out of the, the whole issue was that Richmond made me feel very unwanted and uh, it's pretty hard to play at a club when you, you feel that way so and and Fitzroy do want me. If I had said to you in uh, in August this year that you would have been playing for Fitzroy what would you have said to me? Oh, I would have said uh, get off the drugs. <laughs> yeah, yeah I wouldn't have uh, I would have thought it would be a, a two million to one chance and uh, I would have said you were wasting your dollar. Controversially Richmond parted ways with its captain and power forward Jeff Hogg at the end of 1993. There is no doubt this left Richmond fans worried, as Hogg was the Tigers' leading goal kicker in 1993 with 57 goals. In return, however, Richmond received Paul Broderick, Michael Gale, Matthew Dundas, as well as Mark Miranda and Stephen Jerica in the draft. The Tigers also announced Tony Free as the new captain, and with young Matthew Richardson ready to make his mark, Richmond entered the 1994 season with a renewed but also reserved confidence. Oh, great kick! And a goal! It's been marked by Bond. Bond is still in the defensive half of the ground for the Tigers. His kick goes in near the centre, and a terrific mark taken by Brendan Gale. 
Brendan Gale filled the Tiger problem area of centre-half forward, pulling down 12 marks in a best-on-ground performance. Skipper Tony Free had 22 kicks, and former Woodville West Torrens utility Matthew Rogers made a big impression kicking four goals. He gets onto that left foot and kicks it in the Richardson direction. Punched away by McIver, but Richardson's recovery was brilliant, and he gets the goal in second. He get, tries to gather it again, but Nash was terrific in that contest. Away to Maxfield. A very good kick by Maxfield. Taken by Campbell, and he kicks the goal. After a close loss to Footscray at the Witten Oval in Round 1, Richmond came out and blew away Brisbane at the MCG in their first home game for the year. Richmond then came up against Premiership contenders, the West Coast Eagles, in Round 3. And it's safe to say that the game did not go their way. As Wilson offers a lead, it's all over. Thankfully, at the MCG. So finally, the West Coast Eagles run out most convincing winners, 2015-135 to Richmond's 5-9-30. Following the match, Mal Brown unleashed a scathing attack on current Richmond board members, leading to yet again another club-wide clean-out. It's something that has been given a fair bit of thought, but after losing to the West Coast Eagles, which in the previous uh, um, history since they've been formed, I think their biggest loss was 40, 53 points, I think, mm. and that was a very down day because we did expect uh, the board, the players, the coach, the members, with the recruits we'd got, Broderick was about the third highest possession getter of the year before for Fitzroy, uh, Michael Gale was held in high regard, uh, Deer was uh, a player that we thought would give us someone we'd never had for a few years, Tapin particularly was a boy that had played in a grand final in uh, South Australia and had good credentials and then Rogers was a bit of a bonus, he came up quicker and I think most people ex and expected us to perform and um, I just felt that it's very easy, Richmond had some eight coaches in 14 years, uh, it's very easy to blame the coach, it's very easy to blame the players and they have to take the ultimate responsibility but at the end of the day the members of the Richmond Football Club had been worse performers than the players ever had been because they'd never had an election for some eight years so if you don't create change and people are there all a long period of time and apathy comes in and after that Eagles game we went upstairs and uh, there were certain people that had been drinking and hadn't even come out after half time. Now I could understand that if I'd been watching this for six or eight years, I'd have been the same way. But I don't think that really did anything for uh, demanding from our players and our coaches and our marketing managers and our general managers that this is an intolerable situation. Mel's move in publicly slamming the board of directors paid off last night when Eric Leach, Trevor McGinley, Claude Allen and Mike Humphreys resigned following a crisis meeting. Replacements have already been sounded out. The president today refuted the merger theory. What we are determined about is uh, making the Richmond Football Club one of the powers of the AFL, and that doesn't include uh, mergers. Brown will take over as general manager in the short term, but remains adamant he acted alone and is no power broker like the late Graham Richmond. I think that's an insult on Graham Richmond. I just believe that uh, I was brought over here to give honest opinions and I've tried to do that. I believe now it's all history. That's not the first time it's happened in Richmond or any other club and you get on with the job. A group of ex-stars including Michael Roach and Jim Jess believe the wrong people have been targeted, saying it's recruiting staff that should go. They keep telling each other that they're on the right track, that they're recruiting the right type of guys, but it just seems to me that uh, the club is no better off now than what they were six years ago. What Richmond desperately needs now is a lift in on-field performance. That task begins against St Kilda on Monday. Anthony Hudson, 10 News. After a bleak start and a reshuffle of the board, John Northey and the players found something and led the Tigers to a resurgence that they hadn't had for years. Straight down again. Wren has to mark it, goes to ground, punch forward, handball over to Wren, back to Smart, Smart caught up, Bond again, they're home the Tigers, bow with another one, the Tigers are going to win their fourth game in a row, for the first time since 1985, it's nine long years, and the Tigers have done a remarkable job here.
The siren's about to go. three weeks Collingwood North and the D's but this is the daddy this is the best one no question about that how dare anybody suggest that John Northey shouldn't keep his job after all of this yes. in the last month and good that to see looks, chuck, that. looks as if he might have Tony Free too down there with Curls Bruce I think it was good of him to come across good on you Curls go ahead with the captain of the Tigers yes well we have the captain of the Richmond Football Club Tony Free with us Tony the build up to this game I was down the roof before the game it was very intense and I think John had you in a tremendous frame of mind yeah, he did have some great frame of mind I think the boys are you know, a very determined and very committed bunch at the moment and they're just doing everything they can to win games and I think that's important there's a quarter time when the Crows led into the breeze which was there you boys showed, I thought, then tremendous courage and, and commitment in those finals. You won the hard ball on the ground and you fought hard and you tackled very well. Yeah, the last two or three games we've come from behind and, um, you know, after that first quarter, although I was a little bit worried, you know, I knew the boys were going to fight it out and, um, you know, we knew the Crows generally have a bit of a poor third quarter, the statistics show, so, you know, at half time we were just really committed at the ball and, um, to the boys' credit, they played very well. From rounds 12 to 17, the Tigers won six games in a row and were on a real surge. Lanky Tiger recruit Matthew Richardson proved the perfect replacement for Jeff Hogg, amassing 56 goals in 1994 and only in his second season. With only two rounds to go, Richmond was sitting comfortably in fifth place. All they needed to do was win one of their remaining two matches to secure the team's first final spot since 1981. 60 metres out, Richardson, the kick not particularly good, it wobbles down, it bounces through. Following a 10-goal drubbing of Fitzroy in round 22, Richmond sitting in fifth place, needed to win one of the remaining two matches to secure a slice of the September action. Second place Carlton were the opponents, and Optus Oval the venue. Carlton took control from the start with an eight-goal first turn, and never looked back. Handing out a 113-point thrashing. It's over the top to Mitchell. Quick hands, good of Oh, oh meters in the clear. Gleason runs into an open goal. Another one. Murphy is there once more. Ball pushed towards Bond. A high hurry kick. This is going to be close. It's a goal. If Richmond could defeat Geelong at Optus Oval in the final round of the home and away season, the dream of a finals berth would become reality. Tony Free again showed courage. This time to return to the side after breaking his jaw just 27 days earlier. Forward, here's Murphy. Murphy onto his right foot. He must kick this. A lovely kick by Murphy to goal. Geelong started well in the first term, kicking seven. And with Billy Brownless kicking eight goals from as many kicks, the Cats ran away to a 77-point win. They don't come any quicker replies than that. Did not even come close. With the two losses and the absolute annihilation of their percentage, the Tigers finished the season in ninth. Something, sadly, they would need to get used to over the coming years. So the immediate reaction, I think, was disappointment. And that was, that was the emotion, I think, for that evening. But when you, like sitting here now, and when you look back and reflect and, and be logical about the whole thing and imagine if you were sort of setting goals at the start of the year, then, then I think the club would be fairly satisfied realizing that still you know a lot you know that we can do a lot better and there's a lot more you know a lot more goals that we can achieve but um yeah i think general satisfaction would be a fair enough word coming off their best season in over a decade swooper northy had richmond playing competitive football for the first time since the 80s with names like richardson free campbell knights nash and daffy and rogers leading the way the Tigers also picked up Ross Funky and Jason Tawney in the 1994 draft. But not even the most optimistic of Tiger supporters could imagine what joys the 1995 AFL season had in store for them. 
Hi there, everyone. Welcome along to the MCG for the second day of the season and the first day for the Fremantle Dockers. Today they take on Richmond, a team that won 12 games last season. They're on the ground now. But bearing in mind the Tigers haven't won in round one since 1982. An amazing record. The Dockers out first today in their away strip, predominantly green. And what a big day it is. So Bond, who's been busy in the first quarter, as you would expect, carrying on the good form he displayed in 1994. Big pack of players at half forward. Gale's got a great run! Probably his kicking, though, doesn't quite measure up to his marking, which is certainly his forte. 48 metres out, goes at goal. That's better. Tigers first. A thriller at the MCG. Ten points the difference in the final quarter. Closing stages thereof. Scotty Waters. Gale certainly missed by Richmond off the ground with a back injury. Can the skipper do something? Three misses it. Abraham onto his right boot, a snapshot, Broom oh, again, oh, it bounces, it bounces, it bounces, it's there! Whoa! Whoa. Less than a kick in! I think the time has run out for them. They need to get a free kick from this bounce to have any show whatsoever. There's the siren. Richmond have won it in a thriller. And Jared Neesham ponders what might have been. So near, yet so far. The Tigers beat AFL newcomers Fremantle on the MCG in a very nervous and unconvincing display for Tiger fans, but at least got the season off to a positive start. Following this, they travelled to Waverley and accounted for the Saints, who were actually in their first season without the great Tony Lockett, who had recently moved to Sydney, making it a two-zip start to the year. Round three saw Scotty Turner do what very few other defenders had done and keep the great Jason Dunstall goalless, meaning the Tigers were on a roll at 3-0 and zero to start the year. Richmond's first big challenge, though, came on the Monday night of round four against Wayne Carey and his formidable North Melbourne side, who had gone out in a preliminary final the previous year. And if you want to know what a perfect start to a game looks like, have a look at these highlights. So let's have a look at the kick. The first one at goal. Big start for the Tigers. And already a change for North Melbourne. Ellison coming onto the ground. Mark Roberts off. Greg Deer goes for goal. The Tigers have got their second on the scoreboard. And right at the moment, the way they're getting the ball out of the centre so quickly, it's uh, leaving them one-on-one, -on -one and Edwards has exploited it. Edwards for a fairy tale start for the Tigers has converted. And the start doesn't come much better than that, Joe. It's always exciting when you hear the big roar. Can't get into the ground quick enough. Well, listen to this. If he kicks this, listen to it. Matthew Richardson's got his first. Tigers have kicked four. North Melbourne yet to score. Reynolds comes charging out. Almost took the football with him. Now McMartin had it and then lost it. A snap round the body by Daffy. Oh, there's another one. <laughs> Fairly, the ruck work against Brendan Gale. Brendan Gale too tall, gets it to the front. Here they go again. Duffy's kicked his second goal. The Tigers have got six. <laughs> this is unbelievable. Don't worry about any highlights, Sandy. Victory. Neither can take it. Close to siren time. Kellaway gets the hand pass away. This could be the last kick of the quarter. Oh. The only sour note on Richmond's perfect start to the season was a knee injury suffered by Captain Tony Free. This day, however, there would be a low light. Skipper Tony Free would injure his knee. He would face a knee reconstruction. The loss of Free meant that Vice Captain Matty Knights would lead the side for the remainder of the season. Not only did the wins just keep coming, but the goals also just kept coming for Big Richo, whose start to the season was magnificent. Well, 12 goals won to date. You've given him a rap. Oh, oh, he's kicked it. He has kicked it. His athleticism and pack marking had improved to a whole new level over the off-season, and over the first seven rounds, he had a goal total of 27 goals, three behinds. Sadly, though, 
Richo's unbelievable start to the season came to a sad end in round eight at the SCG. Smiles for most in the Richmond camp, arriving home last night after their courageous win over the Swans in Sydney. But for Matthew Richardson and Stuart Wigney, despair, both suffering long-term injuries. Well, I didn't sleep too well. I think I'd ended up just watching the Indy cars all night, which was pretty boring. But, um, yeah, I was just pretty disappointed all last night. In the light of a new day, Richardson's worst fears realised, his left knee requiring a total reconstruction. If I get it, it gets done tomorrow, I'll just work as hard as I can and if I get back but this year, that's good. If I don't, we'll just concentrate on next year. Richardson, who is enjoying his best season in the AFL, sustained severe damage to his anterior cruciate ligament while trying to avoid the SCG fence, which the Tigers say is too close to the boundary line. Our players highlighted to me last night a grave concern over having to pull up at different times in contests close to the boundary there. Richmond has spoken with the AFL today about the tight squeeze at the SCG. It's hoped action will be taken immediately. It's very disappointing for those. Mary, Matty is very, very upset, as Stewie Wigney. They've been through it before, and particularly when we're rising to the top of the ladder. And... Visiting the injured pair at the surgery today, Tigers captain Tony Free, who is also on the sidelines for the rest of the year with a serious knee injury. A uh, friendly visit as much as anything, just to give a bit of support to Matthew as well as Stuart. I mean, we can't forget him either. He's... He's been outstanding this year and it's got to be disappointing for him. Freezer knows he's been injured a lot lately, so he knows what, uh, what's going on. So just probably do a lot of training with him now and hopefully we can both get back together. Many expected Richmond to fall away with its mounting injury list as the season progressed. However, unlike the past, the Tigers rallied and continued its strong form. Going into round 14 against Carlton, 85,000 people gathered at the MCG to watch the first versus second clash. Next to kick the goal. The Tigers are back with a second goal. Well done, Maxfield. Up by a goal at half time, two Richmond trail by two points at the last change. Enormous skill. Gets onto the left boot. It oh. rolls. It bounces. Will it go through? Yes! Oh, great goal, Campbell. But in the last term, the Blues moved away to win by five goals. The following week, the Tigers faced Essendon on a Friday night in what became the game of the year. Both sides fighting out for a draw in front of 76,000 people. The sleeping Tiger army had well and truly awoken. Essendon's kick is a beauty. Gets O'Donnell. He was going to play on the Mercedes pool to play on. Chips it to Long. Bond comes in. Does it magnificently. Elliot couldn't control it. Dundas's little gift to Bond. Here's a go. Bond to Maxfield. Go and kick the goal, Stewie. Straighten it up. Bang it home. It's a beauty. They're in front of the Tigers. Under Norvi, the Tigers finished the season in third, setting up a blockbuster qualifying final against North Melbourne. First final since the 1982 grand final saw them return to the MCG and meet North Melbourne on a Friday night under lights. The Tigers had finished third with 15 wins and a draw. North sixth with 14 wins. In the two encounters during the home and away games, it was one all. Again, this would be a ripper. On the left, brings it back, close. He's got it. He gets it away from there, couldn't quite kick effectively though. Going back was Rogers, taken away by Tate. He's a good player, isn't he? Jamie Tate sets it up for Narenda, and Narenda's grab was inspiring stuff. Well done from a young man. His kick towards full forward. Oh, great grab by Nash. What Smith ends his head in dismay. Just when Richmond looked like getting on top in the second quarter, Wayne Carey put his mark on the game. In four minutes, he'd restored the balance. Naish and Daffy were potent up forward, but you couldn't help but feel the absence of Matty Richardson. While North had five goal forwards in Longmire and Carey, North had to rely on their smaller crummers to kick the goals. Richmond's five goal loss put them in line for a second semi-final showdown against Essendon. But what a great win for North Melbourne. They're in with a big shot. Rock's quick kick. That's it. The Kangaroos have won. Having gone down to the ruse, Richmond then faced Essendon at the MCG in a second semi-final. Nine touches, Denham. Fantastic goal. 3-3 three, three to one goal. Knights from the centre with one bounce. Takes O'Connor on. Could he squeeze another one? 
Let's go. He's close. He's got it. Sensational. That's his opponent, Denham. You get hold of it in today's football. You really have to do as much as you can to keep hold of it. Struggle for possession around the middle of the ground. Gale. Now Matthew Knights. Every time Richmond looked as though they need something as a lifter, it's Knights. Can he kick his fourth, third goal? He gets inside, well inside 50. This will bring the house down if you don't mind, umpire. It's a goal to Matthew Knights. Things were looking pretty grim too at half time as the Tigers trailed by five goals. In the second half, can the Tigers come back? They go to the left of screen. 4 4 to 9 4. 89,000 fans gathered to watch one of the greatest finals comeback performances of all time. Richmond actually has kicked a goal. At the back, Daffy free kick. At long last for the Tigers. Yeah, it's against Grenville, just home on for too long. Last goal they kicked was in the three minute mark of the second quarter. Knights' is, uh, five bouncer, a beauty. Robbo, as you just sat back on that, as Daffy kicks the goal. Goes for the phone. Ruck contest in the pocket. Taken out of the air by Charles, is it? Now it's Turner. Richmond get the two goals that they were badly seeking. Give it up. Hit and shot, it was OK. It goes forward. Nash is a great finisher. He surely will kick the goal. He has. Round. O'Donnell is having a spell on the bench. We'll wait for a, a report. He looks as though he may be all right. But gee, that was a heavy knock. Grenvold misses it all together. Kicked off the ground by Nay. She's been an important player. Turn it back to Daffy. They get one here. Have a listen to this. Have a listen to this. Daffy kicks his second goal. He's alive and well. It's Essendon by six points. He has lifted his game. He's been asked to play on. He kicks it inside 50. Marking contest. Nash, snapshot by Nash. He's coming around. It's a goal. In front, Robbo. Nash has kicked two. They're in front. Is that the first time today they've been in front? We've kicked five goals in this third quarter. Charles to the goal square. In front, Rogers has got it. This to give Richmond a nine-point lead. They trailed by 30 at half time. They hit the front for the first time in the match late in the third quarter. Rogers from 15 metres out lines them up and kicks a goal. Against the flow, Maxfield kicks it across the face, Rogers again! How the Dickens did Maxfield keep the ball in? It was great effort, a great effort by Charles too, just to go back and make the contest. He has been a good player also for Richmond since crossing from South Australia. He's kicking from 15 metres out, he makes no mistake. The Tiger fans are pretty happy about that. This game at uh, Windy Hill to try and keep them in the competition a couple of years ago. Dead right, 12 14 to 11 7. Jack Dyer coming out here to raise that money that day, leading from the front. Free kick against Essendon, and they're done at the Tigers. John Northey couldn't help himself and celebrated by waving his jacket before charging onto the field. The Tiger fairy tale sadly came to an end in the preliminary final against Geelong. Richmond just ran out of legs and the Cats dominated in the wet. The absence of Richardson was felt as Gary Ablett and Billy Brownless ran amuck. Richmond still exceeded all expectations by ending the season in third position. But the most brutal surprise of the season was yet to happen. A decision that would have ramifications for years to come. Senior players and officials began arriving at Punt Road as early as 8.30 this morning after overnight speculation that coach John Northey was going to quit the club today. However, no one was willing to talk. Oh, look, I can't make any comment at the moment except that John's still got a year to run of his contract. 
and we hope he coaches next year. Uh, no question with the coaching position is that the Richmond Football Club has not terminated John Northey's services. John Northey has work, walked out on the Richmond Football Club. That's very simple. How are you feeling, mate? I mean, what's what's your reaction? Can you feel shit out? Feel shit out. You very upset? Uh, yeah, yeah. Do you leave here with good memories, John? Oh, yeah, yeah. I've had some, you know, the boys have been down here, they've been magnificent. I've had some special moments with the players. They've been magnificent. So. I understand John's motives. He has looked after himself. He hasn't considered the Richmond Football Club. He had a year to go on his contract and he didn't serve it. He's walked out on us. It's a very, I mean, I can't say it any other way. I wasn't asking for too much. I must admit, I don't think I was. Uh, an extension of the contract that the club wouldn't uh, wouldn't uh, agree to. Um, so, you know, that's pretty well it. And I think that John Northey loves the Richmond Football Club, loves the place, loves to coach here. But he's put his security, his personal security, ahead of the Richmond Football Club and his contract with the Richmond Football Club. Their planned secret meeting wasn't so secret. You know, obviously the, the players are a bit on edge and don't know what's going on, that's about it. After meeting behind closed doors for just over an hour, the players had expressed their desire to keep Northey on as coach. Well, the players certainly went in there and just said that we basically support John and that um, you know, we feel that there's, there's good harmony at the club at the moment. We haven't had that for quite some time and, and hopefully you know, the officials have passed that on and they've considered that. Back at Punt Road, supporters had begun a petition and they weren't happy with the club's handling of the situation. I think it, it's really... Despicable, really. What is clear is that the players didn't want John Northey to go. The fans did not want John Northey to go. It was the Richmond board. A man who took Richmond from practically last to third in just three years, who had a year to go on his contract and did what any self-respecting worker would have done on the back of a successful year. He seeked a pay rise and an extension. The club, however, said no. And therefore John went to Brisbane on the back of a much higher offer, angering many fans, players and supporters. John left the club three weeks after helping them win their first final in over 14 years. And although he didn't reveal to the media what it was like at Richmond at board level behind the scenes, his lovely wife sure did. He believes that, uh, uh, in fact, uh, not only believes, I think uh, has a paranoia about uh, Malcolm Brown uh, being... Uh, out to undermine his position in the club. Indeed, Northey did believe he'd been undermined by the Tigers business consultant, the former football great from Western Australia, Mal Brown. That's where it's come from. Nobody will stand up and check Brown. He's been a bully all his goddamn life. You can ask anybody in Perth. And he has wanted, he's set about, he's had his supporters here, namely Pat Stone, a director, He's got rid of some very good people here. No one has been able to stand up to him except John. Who knows what might have happened if the Richmond board and John Northey had come to an agreement. But once again, the Tigers were without a coach, angering both players and fans. Richmond is Wall's fourth club in 14 years and he has proved himself winning a premiership with Carlton in 1987 and this season coaching Brisbane to the finals for the first time in its nine-year history. I guess I'm a coach at heart, that, that's what I, I believe uh, I'm best at and what I enjoy doing and uh, with the opportunity there, well, I was, I was keen to have a crack at it. We threw around the idea of Robert coaching amongst the senior group and I'll tell you what, they're very excited to have someone with such experience and someone that's been there, you know, they've played premiership football, coached premiership football, and that's what we're all about. Walls doesn't intend taking his time to settle in, he's aiming high. Well, I believe that that's what we have to aim at here in the next two, three years is to uh, play in a grand final and win a premiership. I hadn't stepped foot in Punt Road for years and years, and when I did step foot in it, in the boardroom there, it was like nothing had changed for 50 years. I, I went into the Richmond boardroom and big ceilings, dark room, deep wood panelling, tiger pelts on the wall, uh, tiger heads hanging off the wall, 
cobwebs everywhere <laughs> and I looked around and I thought, And Gee. you said yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the things I did look at was the coaching honour board. And this is serious. I looked at the coaching honour board when I was there because I love to look at the history of football clubs and I just saw the length of tenure for the coaches was two years, three years, one year. And I was looking at names like Burke and Jewell and Sproul and Patterson and I looked at it and uh, I didn't say anything to anyone, but I thought, gee, it doesn't instill you with a lot of confidence that they turn their coaches over so quickly. Coach Robert Walls had his eye on Gasper when he first bobbed up in the draft two years ago. The Swans snapped him up then, but Walls has finally got his man. He's still got a lot of learning in front of him, but I just think the uh, potential for him to develop, to develop into a very good player is huge. Fitting tonight's ANC Cup match against Collingwood when two class acts make their returns. Skipper Tony Free and young gun Matthew Richardson are on the comeback trail after knee reconstructions. The Tiger skipper was doing his best to keep his mind off the comeback game tonight, but after doing his knee in round five last year, he's itching to get back onto centre stage. The knee feels great. Yeah. I've done a, like all the pre-season basically. Played a couple of um, intra-club games and um, won against Fitzroy last week. The Tigers will also play exciting forward Matthew Richardson, who after a stunning start to 95, joined free on the sidelines after also undergoing a knee reconstruction. Oh, we'll probably have a quiet word and just see how each other's going, but um, no, we'll look after each other a bit. We'll probably be at different ends of the ground, I'm not sure, but um, I know he's excited. In Warrigal, meanwhile, Richmond has scored a 21-point win against the Swans. high price recruit Darren Gasper was short-changed by this Paul Kelly shirt front. A good sign for the Tigers was the form of Matthew Richardson, who played his best match since returning from a knee operation. Richardson pulled in several strong marks and kicked two goals. Matt Dowling, National 9 News. In 1996, the AFL commemorated its centenary anniversary with multiple celebrations happening across the league. The season, though, was not one to remember for Richmond. Right around Australia, and I think last year when the Tigers uh, made the finals for the first time since 1982, we, we just saw just how many Richmond supporters there are with the huge crowds they were able to uh, get here at the MCG. As Matthew Knight said, keen to lead the side onto the field. Euphoric scenes uh, last time these two sides met with the Tigers coming from five goals down and Johnny Norley was coached that day so it's a whole new ball game just over summer. Quite amazing. Great banner too. Yes I think these two sides will be very strong this season in fact trying to nominate. It's been a tipster's nightmare this year so far. Just looking at the evenness of the competition but in a newspaper article this week I think this could be perhaps a preview of the grand final. Who knows? A long way to go in the centenary year, but the Tigers are on the ground as we take a look at their lineup, Derek. Well, one of the most important additions is the new coach, Robert Walls. Uh, this is his 309th game of AFL VFL coaching after terms at Fitzroy, Carlton, and the Brisbane Bears. And uh, it's a bit of a change in tact uh, that Robert Walls, perhaps more of a tactician, and John Northey, the motivator. And it'll be interesting to see whether Richmond can continue on the momentum from last year. The Tigers were hot and cold most of the year. However, the success of Matthew Richardson was huge. He had his greatest season to date, kicking 96 goals for the year and was a walk-up starter in the All-Australian squad. Chance at the back of the pack, Richardson. It's just been fantastic. Look at this rock snap shot by Richardson. Sensational, that's goal number five. The crumbs, an unlikely roll, grabbed. O'Donnell taking his time, like a basketball team running down the clock. It comes towards Thompson, awkward bounce, Callaway slipped over. There's the siren. And Essendon win this one. Robert Walls' coaching career started off with a loss to Essendon in round one. With huge hype after the success of 1995, Richmond were not only expected to do well, but they were also expected to contend for the flag. And with every loss during the season, the pressure mounted on. Mark is because they stood back off it. And here's Creswell running up on the mark. Doesn't matter, doesn't. He's gone. Benny Gale has his second. A steadier for Richmond. 
It's 8-13, plays 5-10. Now they lead by 21 points. Gathering valuable metres as far as Benny Gale. Keeps it in play towards Bauer. Bauer hooks back over 50, and it's a mark taken by Bond. He's got to move it quickly, and he's got to put a high ball up. Sydney got the numbers. Bond Nothing offering. has a look at goal. Gee, look at the players down there. They're down by a point. He's kicking from 51 metres. He gets underneath it, floats it high into the pocket. No one able to take it. Daffy looks for a free kick for one taken high. There'll be a bounce. Oh, the tension, the pressure as Hayden Kennedy comes in for the last minute. 24 seconds to go. A point the difference. Gee, they're bounce. all up centre of the ground. About 35 metres out from goal. Rucks go at it. A brave umpire couldn't call something oh. there. Down goes Tawny. Slapped out they to O'Loughlin. O'Loughlin clears the zone. One doubt, Richmond have got the they're time running. now. The ball is still running. Well played by the big man. Lockett suckers at Goldwood, consuming valuable time, and he goes again. There's the siren. Sydney have won. What about that? They've plucked it out of nowhere. The Swans' early goals in the final term. And well, let's have a look at the ladder, because for the first time in 1996, Carlton is on top. They were mighty hard to displace last year when they hit uh, top spot after the halfway mark. And the big movers of the last couple of weeks really have been the fact that Sydney have only lost one game in the last nine, and Essendon have won five straight, and West Coast has won six straight. So Richmond tightening it on Adelaide. And if we have a look at last year, in round 11, which is the halfway point, the two teams that fell out of the eight were Fremantle and Adelaide, and the two that actually made the finals were well down at this stage, Brisbane and Footscray, both with four and seven, and both were able to make a late dash, particularly Brisbane, and make the finals. There's a lot of conjecture, and you'd be painfully aware of it, of the change in, in style between John Northey and Robert Walls. Did you, do you subscribe to that? I mean, is the popular theory that Walls is a tactician, Northey the motivator? I mean, is there any credence in that? I think there, there is, Mike. Uh, you know, I've got a lot of respect for John Northey. I think John, as, a, as an opposition coach over the last, what, 10 or more years, uh, he's, he's been a coach who I've always respected, and I think John has the ability to get teams really fired up, and you know that they'll come out and it's going to be a very hard first quarter because they really do fire up. So I've got no doubt that that is, uh, is one of you know, John's greatest assets. Um, on the other side of the coin, you know, as a tactician, a strategist, uh, I'm not quite sure about John's strengths and weaknesses there. Um, but you know, I think you've got to be yourself, and uh, I certainly can get fired up at probably nowhere near as much as John did. Um, but at the same time, you know, as a, as a coach, we put a lot of effort into our planning and preparation, and. As a coach, I believe that 90% of your work is done um, from the Sunday through to the Friday, and then 10% you just top it off, and really that's the player's day. Mm -hmm. Would you prefer not to have it so personal, though? I mean, we can just gauge his performance at Brisbane and your performance at Richmond so clearly, because he was there and you were there. I mean, Malcolm copped it a bit with Gary Ayres, but Malcolm wasn't involved. Lee Matthews a bit with Tony Shaw. But your measurement and John's can be quite precise this season. It's almost like it is personal, isn't it? Well, I in our uh, assessments. Yeah, I guess, I guess it is. Uh, but that's, you know, that's part and parcel of it. Um, I, I went through that ten years ago when David Parkin and I swapped mm -hmm. jobs mm -hmm. and, yeah. and players. Mm -hmm. So that happens. But really, I think in fairness to everybody, it shouldn't be measured over half a season or even one season. I think, you know, look back in three years' time and and then make the decision. Well, it's a good round this weekend. Uh, your game, absolutely vital. Do you get excited when you build up to one like this? I mean, it could be the difference between making the finals and not. Oh, yes. Uh, look, it's it's just terrific to be at the MCG and see crowds of 40, 50, 60,000 uh, screaming out the yellow and black as the team runs on the ground. I can't uh, believe you like that. <laughs> Calvin oh. Platt <laughs> saying he likes that. No, I think it's marvellous. It's a great stadium and, uh, and they're really passionate supporters, the Tigers, so it's a good feeling. He really reacts quickly to get to usable space and uh, dropped uh, smart off by 20 metres doing that. It's kicked terrifically well tonight. Five goals for Richardson.
this tonight is at Richmond is in the eight by 0.125%. The Tigers are in the eight tonight. That's what they're playing for here. Going into round 22, the Tigers required a win in order to make it back-to-back -back finals campaigns. Hawthorne was in ninth, just outside the eight, and if they were to lose their final game of the year to Melbourne, it would actually mean that Richmond would automatically qualify for the finals, regardless of what happened in round 22. They're home. You better kick it. They're home. There's the siren. And Mason in the Hawthorne box. And again in a thriller, Hawthorne have triumphed over Melbourne in a finals atmosphere here at the MCG before 60,000 plus. As a result of the Hawks' excruciating one-point win, the Tigers had to win against fifth place North Melbourne if they wanted to play finals. Then goes backwards in effect. Roberts, Stevens, the man who was speaking of, Laidley, confronted by Campbell, dragged down, there's the siren. It's all over. The loss meant the Tigers finished ninth for the second time in three years and would miss out on finals and end a disappointing season which started with such high expectations. Tony Free would also be amongst the retirees that year, with Matthew Knights being announced as the new Richmond skipper for the following year. And a very good afternoon everyone from the Melbourne Cricket Ground and welcome to the continuation of AFL Round 1 for 1997. And this afternoon from the MCG we should indeed have an absolute blockbuster, Geelong and Richmond. A great crowd in attendance now, probably round about the 50,000 mark. The ground is in absolutely ideal condition. Richmond, well they got back on the winning list of it against Geelong late last year here at the MCG. It was by a big margin. So can they turn it around again today? They are, of course, missing Matthew Knights. Mm -hmm. He is, of course, a big loss. He won't be back until round about uh, round eight or nine, but, of course, counted by the fact that Hocking's not in the Geelong side. Certainly. Uh, Wayne Campbell, though, he led, led them out, as you just saw, his first game as skipper, so he'll be a touch nervous and looking forward to a pretty good performance. Just take a note of number 11, Joel Bowden. Uh, huge wraps on him down at Tigerland. Uh, he, uh, I think, is going to be a very handy player off the half-back line. But the big name, of course, is Matthew Richards, and he's got to kick some goals. Ben Harrison, Joel Bowden, made their debuts in late 1996, and in the off-season, the Tigers picked up Mark Chaffee, Brett Evans and Justin Plapp. In the zone, Bowden, like his dad, plenty of guts. Daffy, inside 50, goes a goal, and has he kicked it? It looks pretty good, all clear, full points. Miranda coming off the ground, and... Uh, Last year's best and fairest winner in Paul Broderick coming on. He's Ten, probably injured also. Ten points the difference. The Cats have certainly got the momentum. We've got half a quarter to go. Powell. Not a great kick off the boot. The bounce is going to be effective. Oh, Broderick slips it up. The duck. Daffy. Under Richardson. 30 metres out. And he's kicked the goal. Round one victors for only the second time in over a decade, the Tigers got their 1997 season off to a positive start. So, Richmond has hung on. 15-14, 104 in a throw at the MCG, defeating a gutsy Geelong, 13-17, 95 before just on 50,000 people. After a positive 3-1 start to the year, the season took a very negative turn very quickly for the Tigers. After making the perfect start to the year with two solid wins over Geelong and Adelaide, the wheel nuts have come loose on the Tiger bandwagon. Three losses from the last four games, including a thrashing at the hands of Port Adelaide, have turned up the heat on coach Robert Walls. Every coach at AFL is under pressure and, you know, you win one week and you know you're two games away from being under pressure again. but. That's the nature of the beast and uh, you live with that. Um, the club here has been very supportive and encouraging through difficult times and that's, that's a true test of a club, I believe. Despite the recent run of poor form, Wall still sees a top four spot as a realistic goal. We still could make top four. As I said, we're 3-3, three, three. we're one game off equal top spot, but it's very hard nowadays to get a team to put together a string of wins, uh, such as the, the toughness and the tightness of the AFL. Richardson will miss at least six weeks after breaking his arm in the last minute of yesterday's match against Port Adelaide. 
Matthew Richardson had every reason to be gloomy when he arrived back at Melbourne Airport last night. If a second successive thumping to the Tigers wasn't enough, a broken arm in the dying minutes completely ruined his day. I suppose I was pretty disappointed anyway, the way I'd been playing and how the team had been playing, so just added to that, I suppose. The way the young bull broke his arm stunned everyone. A freakish collision with teammate Mark Shaffey. I just, well, I was following Huskisson leading for the ball and uh, just sort of got collided with a teammate, yeah, so these things happen. Richmond officials were today ruining the loss of Richardson, who they had planned to take from the ground a minute earlier. I suppose it's a bit unlucky. We've had a lot of injuries this year and it just, uh, it's just more bad luck for us, I suppose. With Richardson out, the Tigers found themselves in a hole and after a disastrous loss to the last place Demons in round 10, the pressure was well and truly beginning to mount on Robert Walls with the side sitting with a 4-6 and six record. The week leading up to Friday night football against 4th place Collingwood in round 11 was huge. Richardson was back from a broken arm and the footy world saw the absolute very best and worst of Richo under the Friday night lights. Richardson to increase the lead to seven points. That's a great kick. That's a rocket kick. It's a goal. Kick away with only straight to Bond and 52 metres. Too far out to kick the goal. On his own in the goal scores Richardson. Now he sets it up for him. Richardson sets himself. Time, the win was a huge upset and it should have galvanised the Tigers for the remainder of the season. The players all got around Robert Walls who had been under pressure and the celebrations that took place after the game were almost reminiscent of a team who had just won a premiership. It's amazing down here Bruce, you can't believe how well the Tigers are going up. I'm going to try and get Robert Walls for a moment if I can. He's a very emotional in his 600th game, very hard to get in here. I'll keep trying. Said it many years ago, Bruce, there's nothing more tigerish than a wounded tiger. And they were wounded. Every one of them will be floating on air this weekend. 
Yeah, it's a great win. I mean, after the week we've had, we've copped a fair bit in the press, so I think we answered a few critics tonight. We're still about the Tigers, don't worry about that. In your conference in front of the goal tonight, you uh, tended to uh, play on every chance you had. Yeah, it was pretty ordinary tonight, I suppose, from a kicking for goal, but I suppose at least if you're getting the ball, you've got something to work with, so we've just got to get out there this week and uh, have some shots at goal and get it right for next week. Thanks very much, Bruce. We'll on a very happy present down here. Oh, yes, uh, Dipper. We, uh, we had to restore a bit of pride and self-respect to the team and the club, and I think we did that tonight, and uh, I'm just very pleased uh, for the players and for Robert Walls and his 600th game of AFL football. Now, winning that game by six points, you're back in the hunt now? Oh, we certainly are. I mean, we've certainly got a long way to go, but we were just uh, more concerned with getting the pride back in the club, and uh, we'll think about uh, the finals a little later on. We're going to get a little more self-respect back game by game. Collingwood didn't lose a lot of percentage, but they did lose a vital game in their third. They're down to 119. They've gone from 141 to 119 in the last three. And Richmond jump up a lot, but their percentage is still a worry at 84. The team was hoping to gather momentum as they launched into the back half of the season. Sadly, though, this wasn't the case for the Tigers or for Robert Walls. Tigers try to work it forward, hard in the road, or Bullis collects him. Back it comes to it, and Ben Dale takes the mark. A huge win to the Adelaide Crows. There's the fans are ecstatic. They led all night. 137 points. It would be ludicrous, I think, to get rid of Robert Walls with five weeks to go. He deserves far better than that. Richmond assured me today that nothing was happening in that area, so yeah. let's hope they're true to their word. All right, Stephen, believe you. Believe them. You just In football, you never know. <laughs> Thanks, Stephen. Mark Doran's there at the moment. Mark, uh, what can you tell us? Well, David, it's been a day of major development here. The board members, in fact, some of them are still arriving. So this decision has been made without total board support, which tends to say that uh, this decision was probably made uh, a few weeks ago. We remember that Robert Walls was under pressure, but after Saturday night's 137-point loss to Adelaide, uh, the board's had enough and Robert Walls is going. The Tigers are going nowhere. They've only won six games and are 15th, second last on the ladder. So they're hoping that a bit of change, similar to, I suppose, what Joseph Gutnick thought would work with the Melbourne, a bit of change might help the Tigers and spur them along. Right. The players were, were informed today, David, and uh, they are split. There was a lot of support behind Robert Walls, and they are very disappointed at this decision. So any uh, idea who's going to replace him yet? At this time of year, you would imagine that Jeff Geeshan, who's the assistant coach in cohorts with probably Tony Free, who is another assistant coach, the former captain of the Tigers, would take over for the next three games. And I suppose for Jeff Geeshan, who's been around for quite a while, this is an audition for him for the big job next year. Excited. They've probably written themselves off earlier in the year, but uh, through fate, they've got a great opportunity. Loss against Melbourne may prove costly, of course. Uh, that was totally unexpected when they got beaten by the Ds. Richmond, well, they've carried all before them since Jeff Geeshan took over as coach at round 18. They've only lost once since. They've made one change this afternoon. Michael Gale coming back into the side for also Baldwin. Unbelievable, isn't it? Extremely passionate. Very impressive. The kick by two defeaters is a goal. It looked a very doubtful quantity off the boot, but it must have got through by just the barest margin. Silvani punches. Broderick, a little give. Knights. Harrison goes at goal, and Richmond have hit the front for the first time. Down it goes, up goes the Ruckman, and well done Tigers. Good night Blues. Gieson does it again. The Tigers... Three out of the last four. Another thriller. And they've come home to get the bargain again. Captain coach Jeff Geeshan led the club for the remainder of the season, culminating in a famous win against the Blues at Princes Park in round 22. The Tiger fans were happy with the way that Jeff and the Tigers had finished off the season, with the banner proudly reading Unleash the Geesh in a nod to the fans' desired coach going forward. The Tigers will announce in the next hour that Geeshan will lead the club in 1998. Geeshan's appointment to be rubber-stamped at a 6pm board meeting comes with the backing of most supporters. It's believed the caretaker coach was delighted when told the news today after surviving a final interview yesterday. A lengthy final interview was also conducted yesterday with Sydney Swans assistant Damien Drum. It's believed the Tigers informed Drum today his bid had failed. 
Geeshan's appointment comes as no real surprise. Four wins from the last five games sealed the job for Geeshan, who has waited almost 20 years for a job at league level. With the coaching job out of the way, the Tigers can now concentrate on what is expected to be an aggressive recruiting drive. And there it is. Richmond Premier's in the reserve. Jeff Geeshan. What a year he's had. Appointed senior coach, reserves premiership coach. Even after he'd been appointed senior coach, Geesh led the reserves to a premiership flag in the curtain raiser to the 1997 AFL Grand Final. The Tigers then had a big clean-out during the off-season. Richmond veteran Chris Bond was traded to Fremantle in exchange for pick two in the draft. This was massive for Richmond as they selected Brad Ottens from South Australia. Chris Naish was also traded to Port Adelaide. Jamie Tape went to Collingwood, and the Tigers also picked up Andrew Kellaway and Greg Tivendale with their later picks. And a very good afternoon everyone, welcome to the MCG, we're in the Tigers room, Essendon and Richmond flashing this afternoon at the MCG, one of the blockbusters of round one, the beginning of the 1998 AFL Coca-Cola season, a big game. Uh, even though both sides are depleted by injury, uh, Richmond know Richardson, Joel Bowden, and also David Burke and Essendon know Alessio, Mercedes and also, uh, who else is there, someone else is there, Pete, but here's the Tigers on the, up on the screen here, we've got Rogers and Gaspin Calloway in the back half, Blurt and Bullis Gale. Also, Miranda, Broderick and Knights. The half forward line of Daffy, Brennan Gale and Brenny Moore. Holland, Manfield and Robbie Powell across the forward line. The Rucks of Ottens, a young player from Adelaide. Also, there's the interchange bench of Tawny, Chaffee, Harrison and Ryan. In round one, 1998, the Tigers were without Matthew Richardson, who would actually miss five of the first six games of the season. They went into the game massive underdogs against Essendon in Geeshan's first official game as Richmond's senior coach. Knights trying to draw a man. Broderick, Michael Gale, off the left on the boundary line. His brother's in the goal square. Might be a goal! Step it through. It's through, it's a goal. Richmond in front. So another chance for the Tigers inside 50. Gale, it's been terrific. Benny Gale, quick snap. Oh, listen to the crowd. He has drilled it. have been good. Chaffee missed it. He spent a lot of time on the bench. There's the siren. The Tigers of course, another upset. Coming from behind to beat the well-fancied Essendon combination. 14-9, 103-13-11, 89. Yeah, look, um, when we lost Richardson, Bowden, Burke, I mean, we knew Charles wasn't going to be there for a lot of the time. Um, at good this stage, you don't get a chance to pop plan a pre-season based around finding another forward structure so we had to sort of come up with something reasonably quickly I thought today to have 20 odd shots for goal around half time was an amazing effort from a group of blokes that none of them had a history of kicking goals so look I think that probably as much as anything over the last couple of weeks fell into a bit of good play by a midfield and defence and some honesty by our forwards as much as anything but look it gives us a little bit of confidence I suppose to know that we've got players to come back in the next four or five weeks that might even be able to help us a little bit more there. Two weeks later, the Tigers were in massive trouble against the Hawks and found themselves behind by 42 points early in the game. But thanks to a range of fresh faces, including Brad Ottens, Ben Holland, Ben Moore and Ben Harrison, they mounted a stirring comeback. Tigers playing on with the football. Ryan's kicked towards the 50. Marked by Campbell. Hand pass comes out to Campbell. That was interesting. He had passed to himself okay. and kicked the goal. It was Harrison to Campbell. James to the 50. Moore, number 28, gets free. Puts it wide for Gasper. Gasper for goal. Has kicked it. Open forward line. Roderick off the left. Peeling up from defence is Prescott. He can go all the way, Ashley Prescott, and get them to within a point. He steadies, hoists it high. Ottens is in the goal square, and Harrison, and Holland! Holland is goal! Five goals to Ben Holland, and a point the difference in twilight footy at the MCG. Tigers yet to 
grab the lead, but once they do, they'll almost be unstoppable. Yes, Hawthorne have led all day. Ottens, third break mark for the last quarter. What a terrific mark. This kid certainly shows a lot of promise, Jerry. Just 18 years of age, he came with huge wraps, and look at this. <laughs> he was up there for a week. Going into round 15 against Carlton, the Tigers were looking for a win that would put them back inside the top four for the first time since 1995. Richo was also back on the side, returning from injury, and the team was building great momentum. Awkward spiralling punt kick, Broderick, down to Bowden, he's a good kick. Joel Bowden is a beautiful kick. Tigers have got their second. Evans, in towards half forward. Yes, Richardson. And Matthew Richardson has converted, he's kicked his first. He's a beautiful finisher, wobbly one, Richardson and Kudafidis, important, Richardson with a chance, Kuda went to ground, Richardson kicks his second, and the Tigers bounce back. Goes for it, beautiful kick off the boot, not quite, fly by Richardson, unopposed in the end, and Richardson is about to kick his third. He's kicked 28 goals in his last six going in, and three tonight. So the Tigers stretch it now. They've kicked 11 of the last 13 goals. That is a scary stat. It's 11-4 to 6-2. But Evans is on the end of it. Very skillfully to Rogers. Rogers off the left. Quickly it goes back in the Richardson direction. Back here is Beaumont. And Plapp has kicked five as well. Messi kicks to the front of the square. Allen was being held on to. The siren sounds. The Tigers have a big win. Tonight, so the boys really mature tonight. Yeah, look, I think as the year's gone on, we've got a little bit mature week by week. And uh, early in the year against Collingwood, four goals early to Collingwood, we got blown away. And uh, tonight we had the strength to fight back, probably against an underman Carlton, however. Didn't Jeff Geeson speak well there? Uh, giving Carlton its due respect, which was terrific to hear. Matthew Richardson had another big match. He's with the Big Dipper. Thanks very much, uh, Bruce. Another big match for you, son? Oh, yeah, not too bad. It was another good win, and everyone chipped in tonight. And just, uh, I suppose they got off to a good start, but we fought back well. So, yeah, we're pretty happy with that. I was just saying, Matty, not you didn't panic at all, but you've got a few friends up there who can kick goals in now. Yeah, that's right. I mean, Plappy's had a great start to his league career, you know, eight goals and two yeah, games. So, yeah, he's really helped out. And with Ben Holland going off, it was good that Plappy stepped up. For 17 of the 22 rounds in the 1998 season, the Tigers finished inside the top eight. However, a disastrous loss to the last-placed Hawthorne at Waverley Park late in the year meant that they needed to win their final game of the season against the fourth-placed Demons to make the finals, or suffer finishing ninth for the third time in six seasons. Whoa, whoa. Demons just chipping the ball around. They have plenty of options. Here's McDonald out wide on the left foot. Now they penetrate towards the goal line. Up goes five! Melbourne, led by Jeff the Wiz Farmer, absolutely destroyed the Tigers and they would go on to reach the prelim finals that year. For the Tigers, meanwhile, it was Groundhog Day yet again. James McDonald, the Demons in the finals and in fourth place. After a year of such promise and improvement with younger players coming through, the ninth place finish was a crushing result for Tiger fans and players. Jeff Geeshan had the side playing exciting attacking football, so there was great enthusiasm about the prospects of the 1999 season. At the conclusion of 1998, big man Michael Butch Gale retired, leaving a hole in the Richmond's ruck stocks. The Tigers also delisted a massive nine players, including Nathan Bauer, Paul Bullis, Justin Charles and Ashley Prescott. They also traded away draft picks 8 and 24 in exchange for Geelong player Craig Bitterscombe and former Brisbane player Rory Hilton. 
That really left Richmond with only two draft picks in the draft in the fourth round. James White and Mark Dravasevic. That it's taken this long uh, for Mark to be picked up? Yeah, we are surprised. We're chatting about it during the break. He's, uh, he's a Rob Harvey type. I don't want to pin that on him. He's he'd be as good as Rob Harvey, but he's one of those swerving... T he just finds the footy the whole time and gets out of traffic pretty easily and lays it off magnificently. It was deja vu in round one of 1999, as the Wizard kicked six and Melbourne beat the Tigers by 17 points. In round two, Richardson kicked four goals to help Richmond win their first game of the year over the Swans, before a 10-point loss to North Melbourne in round three. Richmond then belted Collingwood in round four by 50 points to leave their season at two and two after four rounds. His kick goes down towards the wing. Good interception there by Darcy. He's been on the bench for quite a while. That should be a free kick against Powell. Should have been on Gasper. Darcy too. Gee, oh, the whistle away. Yes. Winmar with the footy. Runs away from half forward. Good kick by Nicky Winmar. Rowan Smith is sharing an update. Oh, look at those two or three paces. That's got him. After being on the receiving end of a 62-point hiding to the Western Bulldogs in round five, things started going downhill. This was followed by a 35-point loss to Essendon and a three-goal loss to Carlton, leaving the Tigers third last on the ladder going into round eight. Finds Daffy. He's had no influence on the game so far. Outside of 50. Pings it to the square. Hilton's gone. He's going to kick a goal. Now, you'd think a 50-point lead late in the second quarter would have made Geishan relax ever so slightly. Think again. Tries to rip the ball out of the arms that time of Andrew Callaway. And again, a ball up. It's just 25 metres out from Brisbane's goal. Jeff Geishan looks on. An anxious Jeff Geishan. What a week it's been for Richmond. Talk of a new coach. Talk of a new president. Talk of a new chairman of selectors. Talk of coups. Lappin. Centres the ball, he was looking for Leppage, it was unselfish play, tried to set it up, here's Lawrence, 35 metres out, concedes ground and finds Boyd, directly in front, Brad Boyd, puts the Lions in front, Michael Voss in the grandstand, the skipper and his brother Brett, just barracking their hearts out for the Lions, what a turnaround. They're two points in front, they were 50 points down in that second quarter, and they look gone. Four minutes remaining. Well, if Jeff Geeshan was under pressure last week, what will next week be like if the Tigers lose this, having led by 50? Well, it's 34 scoring shots to 27. Brisbane clearly in front, they've had so much of the footy, it'd just be uh, difficult to see how they're going to lose it from here. He's got Owens in the square. Kicks it deep into the forward line, Richardson's there! Taken by Bradley, quick snap. He's got it. Tigers in front. The crowd at fever pitch. Free kick. Advantage to Richmond. It comes wide. Lionel Crocker, most of the day on the bench. He kicks to Richardson. Matty Richardson, near the boundary line. 50 metres out. Two and a quarter minutes left. And the Tigers up by four points. If he nails this... They'd like their chances of winning the game. Magnificent kick! What a goal! The Tigers now sense victory. Thump the ball deep in the forward line. Richardson could take it. Just a bit off balance. Back to Richardson. Quick snap. Goal number six. You can see the relief on his face. Alan Joyce there as well, chairman selectors. And the Tigers have well. the pressure today. 135. Oh, Sons has been every week. Cool. You know, every game is a big game, and our preparation and thoroughness doesn't change from week to week. And today we just got to score at the end of the game, which is great. What do you thought when you're 50 points up and they come back at you again? Do you think about deja vu? 
Um, look, we were challenged strongly there. I think they kicked five unanswered, but we kicked the next three, and that gave me a little bit of heart to think that, you know, there was a bit of character there, but in the last quarter, we just went to a couple of little different structures that played it a little bit simple, went a little bit longer, and it paid off for us. Matthew Richards was fantastic. Oh, I love him, mate. I just love him. His uh, spirit for the Tigers is unquestionable. I know that he makes the odd mistake here and there, but don't ever want anyone ever say that that kid can't play and he's not developing as a player. He's special. Good on you, Geish, and enjoy Thanks, the Matthew. success. The Tigers held on to win, and Geeshan held on to his job. But with the Tigers 3-5 and five after eight rounds, things weren't about to get any easier, as they had to venture to Footy Park for a match against dual running premiers Adelaide in round nine. To Callaway, a beautiful little tap. Now the opportunity is with Broderick. He looks inside 50. They can go all the way here. This is the youngster in Ben Hollands with an S. Can he go for the Tigers? Kicks it back up towards half forward. Burke is there outside 50. Kicks it in towards the pocket. Richardson is there. I understand why Connor didn't suffer the ball off the ground. Yeah. Two goals for the night. 26 for the season, but that's the most important one, maybe. And he's got it. James couldn't hold the slippery one. Robren comes in over the top. It's socket off the ground. And there it is. The boys from the benches have leapt out and gone to make their charges. This is a big win for the Richmond Football Club. Trailed and every change bar the last. Down two points at quarter time, five points at half time, one point at three quarter time, and they've got up to win a thriller and they've got the club song out on the ground. I wonder if we can pick it up. Maybe we can open Curl's microphone because he's down there. Yeah. Moving across slowly. Yeah, a bit of the old water in the microphone there, but you might be able to get someone there, Curls. Jeff Geeshan, isn't he? You're at. No, I got, got Nick. Hi, Nick uh, Daffy was here. Good boy, go for it. Okay, well, Nick, that was a that was a tough one. Mate, that's one of the best wins I've been involved in for years. It was fantastic. Oh. This weather, we love it. We love the wet, actually. Well, it's amazing. When it did start to rain heavy, yeah. you boys got on top. Yeah, look, we controlled it. I thought we controlled it well early. We wasted a lot, but then in the end, uh, oh, we just we just come so far and we've, we haven't been playing well and we've been getting criticised and a win like this can hopefully get us started for a good year. Looked like there was a specific game plan with the, the extra forward down the back area. Yeah, look, we tried, I think, Ben Harrison back there and uh, at one stage there, Eccles was getting a bit of the ball and I think we, we might have went one-on-one -on -one after half time and I think it worked really well. A couple of weeks ago, you had some knockers over in Melbourne, but I think you've answered them. Yeah, for sure. I think they'll get into a few of the senior players and saying we couldn't handle the taggers and stuff. But, I mean, we had guys like Benny Hollands and Lionel Crocker come on today. You know, the 18th sort of players doing really well, and that's what you need. So, Well played. Enjoy yourself. Thanks. Good luck. After celebrating on the field in the wet, the Tigers season began to turn around as the team started to get onto a run of wins. Friday night football yet again at the Melbourne Cricket Ground. It's been a wet, late afternoon here in Melbourne. Conditions could favour the Tigers, maybe. They've lost two by a goal or less. Tigers have won plenty of quarters, but they haven't won too many matches this year. So what do they have to do to win? You mentioned Richardson 18 marks, but he only got one goal against all of them. What does that tell us? Well, I think the key is don't criticise Matthew Richardson. Criticise their game plan. I mean, if he has to lead up to the wing to get it, look at that 64 marks in the midfield and only 32 in the forward 50. They have to style their play around, kicking it deeper into the 50 metre line and letting Matthew Richardson take his marks there where he can actually punish the opposition side and have a bigger influence on the match. Cats kicking to the left of screen. There's McGrath and Richardson. Graham's got flat, poor bounce to start at Odden's in the centre square. Such an important game for both these clubs tonight to make something of 99. All is not lost for the winner, you'd reckon. Well done by Holland, and then belts it forward. Not a very good looking kick, but it's very effective. Richardson's going to kick a behind. Really, well, he tells the tale. He knows he should have done better. What about the Tiger bench, uh, Dipper? And hold uh, your breath here. There's one that you remember. Yes, my good mate, Mark and <laughs> <laughs> uh, Brett Evans, Brendan Gallen, Michael Brockner. Good on you, Dipper. 
It's not. Quick kick. Almost to 50 here. McGrath, well, he missed it in the end, and Richardson takes off, and Richo goes, bends it back. Well, oh, how about that, that one? one? Missed the easy one, kicked the hardy. Show breaking through Daffy. Show held him up a bit. Daffy's handball to space. Sampson will have to come back. He does. Platt went in and did a shepherd. Sampson to the goal square. Richo's got it. Push. A push. Oh, it's got 50 to be metres too. And uh, has to be. That's pretty ordinary, isn't it, Jason? Yeah, I mean, if he's uh, not careful, he'll give another, another, away another one, Robbo, because he's disputing the decision now. So, uh, well, once it's done, it's done, yeah. John. I mean, you just today's football, you just got to uh, cop it sweet. And McGrath's going to kick it to Sanderson. So some rebound footy here. Uh, ben Graham, a target. Kicks to full forward. Hawkins at the back. Oh, got it. Graham. Graham. Graham's got it. Ottens came in from the side, oh. but Graham's got it. Richard, let's have a look. And he's kicked seven in the last two weeks now. Well, yeah. I don't know. I don't yeah, but it, as yeah. Robbo said, well, you've got to cop it sweet no matter how angry you are. And uh, he's coming off now, assisted by the runner. Yeah. I'm sure we'll have a chat to Jeff Geeshan. And, Jace, we've mentioned it a few times. If there are two distinct actions, the push and then the mark, nine times out of ten, the umpires will penalise it for marking interference. And rightly so, because uh, otherwise his intention is just to get rid of McGrath in that marking contest before well, the ball's there. Well, John, it's the coach who just has to show strength here because there's 21 other players that he's asking to do the right thing. And when you've got your star player doing something like that, he just can't get away with it. And Jeff Gershon showing a bit of strength there to have a chat to Matthew Richardson. We've got two minutes left in the first term. He can settle, get back at the start of the second term and get right into it again. I was watching Jeff Keisham give him that message uh, as the box is right behind me. He just said it calmly, uh, Robbo. He yep. didn't scream at the young boy. He just uh, said, uh, yeah, stick around the forward line. Just... He'll kick the ball close to half forward. Up in front, great, uh... great Mark Richardson. That's Matthew Richardson, of course. His kick in towards full forward. The leap from behind was by Holland. Kick forward by Samson! Well played by Mansfield. Quick kick by Arna. Dragosevic will want this to stay in. Runs hard. Might have a bit of time to look up. Bowden's outside 50. Decides to bring it back to full forward. Richardson, McGrath. Richardson's got it. Well, I talked about Ben Graham at the other end. This bloke has been a star. It did look like that from here. His prime objective must be to mark the ball. Here's the angle from the other end. He's kicked four goals for tonight. 5-4. He's the match winner at the moment. Got a contract that he might be negotiating. Powell, right foot kick by Robert Powell, oh, and he's really? got it again. <laughs> now, you know, that's the one. <laughs> the first action to push him out of the way, the second action to go for the mark. It has to be a free kick on every occasion, and I'd suggest that maybe somebody should tell Matthew Richardson that during the week because uh, he seems to be disputing the obvious. Contest there, Callaway provides the shepherd to allow Campbell to kick the ball forward, yes. Clean mark on this occasion. Well, that's the best possible answer. It's Get in front, isn't it? Just giving away a free kick. Forget about it. Attack the ball. This is a good, strong mark. He had the prop and weight. He fought to hold his position. McGrath tried to spoil, but he was just too tall and too strong in front. Towards full forward. Sampson trying to find some space. Back to Scholl. Nick Daffy across his left shoulder. Matthew! Spectacular stuff again by Matthew Richardson. Carey -like. This has been a carry like performance. It has. He'll be king of Tigerland tonight. And when his confidence is up, he just starts flying from all different sorts of positions, gets his hands to it and drags it in. I mean, that's that's the sign of a player who knows his game is on tonight. Well, deserves this, deserves to kick six tonight. And the administration at Richmond have better sharpen their pencils and get a signature pretty quickly because you couldn't afford to let him go. He's done it. He's kicked his sixth goal. It's going to be a long weekend. A very long weekend. Dipper, it was a huge night for Matthew Richardson. Fantastic, Bruce. As Bruce said, it was a huge night for you. 11 scoring shots and uh, 17 uh, kicks around the ground. Magnificent game by yourself tonight. Yeah, it was just a good all-round team effort. Dipper, we needed a win really badly tonight. And uh, when it was there to be won in the last quarter, everyone dug deep and uh, come out with a good win. The important part for yourself, for the conference, you got those early goals and those banana kicks you've been practising. Yeah, mate, it was just good to get a couple early. I suppose it always helps your uh, confidence later in the game. It was a very tight game, uh, Richard. I mean, the last four or five minutes just run away with the game. Yeah, I mean, it was close up until the 25-minute mark, and we got a bit of a run on in the end, so it was good, I suppose, to kick a few in the last quarter.
Were you, uh, were you unhappy about uh, getting taken off the ground with a bit of dummy spit there? Oh, no, mate, on yours. <laughs> Come on, <laughs> that's for sure. Well done, Jeff Geeshan. He's got a lot of flat, Jeff, Jeff Geeshan, this year. Patrick Smith's Very pencil's much. been pretty sharp on uh, on uh, Geish during the year, but uh, here he is with the dipper. Well, uh, Geish was a magnificent win by your boys then. Yeah, I mean, uh, probably halfway through the last quarter, Geelong had a bit of momentum there, so it caused a little bit of concern, I suppose. They're starting to run well, and Graham was always a headache up forward when he was there, and it looked as though at that stage you are in a bit of trouble, but the kids really dunk deep. I thought tonight was really significant. Uh, kids like Dragosevic and, uh, oh, good, good. yeah, Ottens, uh, you know, some of our lesser lights, McKee, the kids that we've been sort of bringing along and bringing along, giving them game time and experience, all of a sudden all blossom together tonight. So we're wrapped about that because Nida and uh, Cambo and, and some of the others were down a little bit and uh, these kids stepped up for us, so we're wrapped about that. And yeah, well, they just say the young witch over quarter time then? Obviously a bit of a dummy speed out that 50 metre. Oh, look, you know, we've been uh, working very hard with Richo for some time now about his body language and about his discipline up forward and stuff like that. And, look, there wasn't much in it. Sure. He got a, it was a push out there and he got penalised and then he got the 50 metres. And I just wanted to remind him he's been magnificent in that area most of the year and we just didn't want him going back to old ways. And uh, he came back on and he certainly did what we asked him to do. I think he's kicked six goals and 13 marks. The club uh, certainly has uh, caught a bit of flack over the season, uh, but this uh, a win like this uh, obviously gives the club a lot of confidence. Oh, it does. I mean, we're very young. I think it's been overlooked, the fact that there's been a bit of a changing of the guard with people like Charles and uh, Michael Gale and Trent Nichols and sure. Bauer and some of these players moving on and the Dragosevics and Ottens and McKees and that having to take up a bigger role. And it takes a little bit of time for those guys to find their feet. And they're starting to do that now. I mean, we're halfway through the season. I just hope out of it they get that self-belief and confidence that we've been looking for. And if they do that, we're going to be competitive right throughout the rest of the year. Following the Geelong win, the Tigers travelled west where they beat the Dockers in a one-point thriller. Ben Hollands kicking the winner. This left them just outside the eight going into a big Friday night clash against ladder leaders West Coast in round 15 at the MCG. Richardson's got it. He'll have to kick the ball 45 metres plus. He gets the distance and he's got the accuracy. Tigers have got three. Chasing him now is Rogers. Like to see Rogers in the forward line. Handball missed at Mark. Sampson, good kick. Gives Richo the charge. He's got it. Great move. An upset win meant that Richmond had revived their season and squared the ledger at eight wins and eight losses. However, just three weeks later, after beating the ladder leaders, they faced last place Collingwood at the MCG. Let's just say footy is a funny game. As Knights drives it forward, there's the siren, no mark. And look at Eddie Maguire, he's wrapped. Tap on the back for Tony Shaw. Well, Richmond, there are players hanging their heads, and so they should, because it just seems that recently, when all's to play for, the Tigers go missing. They did it last year in the last round against Melbourne, made a chance of making the finals. They came in here today, one game and 6% outside the eight, and they've just blown officially their chances of playing in September. Well, you can see the look there on Jeff Gushin's face. He's a pretty disappointed coach. A lot to play for today, the Tigers. It'll be interesting to see with the season gone for the Tigers, whether or not they'll make some significant changes to their, their lineup in the latter last three games of the year to see whether or not they might have a new structure leading into next year because it certainly hasn't worked so far this year. Latest AFL coaching casualty. Just over an hour ago, Gishin announced he will quit as Tigers coach after Friday night's game against Carlton. And the Tigers have admitted the man they want is Kevin Sheedy. In the end, the constant speculation and pressure of coaching proved too much for Jeff Geeshan, walking away today from a contract with two years to run at Richmond. It's a sad day in a lot of ways for me, but um, by the same token, I felt it was um, something that I had to do in the, in the good of the Richmond Football Club. Having been under the blowtorch all year with his team beginning poorly and underachieving throughout the winter, Geeshan has lost the fire to go on. Just at this point in time when the club is going heavily towards planning for next year, I, I felt a little bit uneasy about the fact that I didn't feel 100% certain in my mind. The toughest decision of Jeff Geeshan's life was made easy. Told last week the Tigers had approached Kevin Sheedy, he decided to jump first and today negotiated a six-figure settlement to leave the club. I sort of really started to question uh, you know, whether I thought I could really continue under the sort of pressures that you're under. It's understood President Leon Daphne phoned Sheedy several times last week 
a factor Geeshan admits contributed to his decision. I guess it puts it into perspective and makes you realise that, you know, maybe uh, the club think there might be a better person out there than yourself. Geeshan's departure has the Bombers in a panic with Kevin Shooty in his strongest ever position at the club and the Bomber coach is doing nothing to douse speculation he might accept an offer to join the Tigers. Would you consider going back to punt, right? Um, at the appropriate time you would, yeah. And if I didn't end up going back as coaching, I could always go back at a board level. The Bomber board will decide on Thursday whether to up the ante on a two-year offer to Sheedy. We can't let whatever happens at Richmond bother us. So we've got to do what we think is the right thing and get that finalised. Daphne, who wants to continue as president, will not be drawn on Sheedy. Football director Tony Jewell with other suggestions. I think, I mean, who, what do Richmond need at the moment, rather than a candidate? What, what sort of Oh, person? JC, I think, at the moment. <laughs> well, it's taken a long time, but this is the round we've been working towards. Round 22 in the home and away season. It starts tonight here at the MCG. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. It's a pretty cool but very wet MCG. Richmond, though, of course, have been one of the key newsmakers in the past two weeks. For more on that, let's welcome to our telecast, Mark Doran. Thanks, Sandy. Yeah, a very tumultuous week at Tigerland. There's been plenty of talk about coaches, none more so than at Richmond. Jeff Geeshan, of course, falling on his sword, or depending who you talk to, being pushed, and Richmond wasting no time in finding a replacement. They're after Kevin Sheedy. To that extent, I'll talk to President Leon Daphne at half-time. But earlier on tonight, I spoke to Jeff Geeshan, and not surprisingly, he was a little bit flat. I absolutely love the three years I've been at Tigerland, and... Um you know, cherish the memories of being here, but obviously, you know, it's a little bit of a hollow feeling knowing that uh, you won't be back here for next season. Is it almost hard to front up tonight? Oh, definitely not, no. Um, you know, I feel that um, it's a great challenge tonight and uh, it gives us a chance to sort of be with the players and have the opportunity to say goodbye at the end of the game and, uh, and, and to try and win a game of football for the Richmond Football Club. So I'm actually glad the way it's turned out and, uh, you know, as much as it was a little bit uh, indifferent early in the week, tonight I feel really ready to go and I hope the boys do as well. The Tigers made no secret that they wanted the out-of-contract Kevin Sheedy to coach the team going forward. Now, I'm not a big believer in omens, but if the scoreboard at the city end of the MCG was somehow linked to Richmond's chances of actually getting Kevin Sheedy, then things weren't exactly looking that good. Well, you're not going to believe this. The scoreboard here at the MCG is on fire. We started out by seeing a small flame just above the clock, and that has grown in the last 30 seconds. This scoreboard could blow up. Make no mistake about that. And isn't it ironic? The smoke-free sign could go as well. But we have potentially a very dangerous situation. There are sparks flying. Those flames are really blowing into the night now. This scoreboard could explode. Um, but just let's hope that it can be controlled and there's nothing that is explosive inside there. Now uh, the fire brigade are getting things under control. Well, they've even got a problem with the pressure hose. That's <laughs> leaking as well. The Tigers went on to beat the Blues in Geeshan's final game, which interestingly gave him a greater than 50% winning record as Tiger coach. Out of the 49 games he coached at senior level, he ended up with 25 wins and 24 losses. After a week of sleepless nights, Kevin Sheedy answered the $1.8 million question, rejecting a massive offer from Richmond this morning, one just last week he was set to accept. It probably at one stage I, I, I nearly uh, could have been moving that way. The Richmond offer says Sheedy was one of four from other clubs. The emotional attachment of Tigerland hardest to turn down. Probably like saying to yourself, well, gee whiz, you know, you, you've got a son and a daughter, and which one do you really care about? And you really care about them both. The three-year deal was the Bombers' third attempt in a month to re-sign him after original offers of one- and two-year terms, which would not have kept him at Windy Hill. No. Not at all. Not when I know what the offers were uh, from other clubs and uh, or were from other clubs and uh, well, definitely not. One man who does know where he's going is Danny Frawley, appointed Richmond coach for three years. The third longest serving captain in AFL history, Spud was careful not to talk of finals or premierships, but did promise a tougher Tiger team. Probably some of my values in life about honesty, discipline, commitment and trust. And I think that uh, if you keep to those values and stick by them, through thick or thin, uh, you can't go wrong. Danny Frawley is the new Richmond coach. The former St Kilda captain has just fronted the media and now joins us live from the city. Congratulations, Danny. Good evening, Quarters. Took a lot of hard work to get there, didn't it, in the end? 
Oh, listen, it was a, it was a very uh, long, drawn-out process, quarters, but um, listen, I'm just really pleased and honoured to obviously uh, come out on top of the other eight candidates, and uh, Richmond really put faith in me to, to bring the club into the new millennium for the next three years.